Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture. Um, today, we're going to be talking about cognitive and biological development and aging. So today's lecture is a little bit um, psych -soch and some bio-biochem as well. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm one of the MCAT tutors with Socratic Med, and I will be leading today's lecture for you guys. So here I have linked our group me. So this is where we will post the links to these lectures once they're uploaded to YouTube, um, as well as where you can ask our tutors any questions that you might have just in general or about specific videos that you're watching. Um, I also have our Instagram here and our YouTube channel, which is where you'll be able to find all of these question-based learning course videos. Um, as well as a variety of other lecture courses that we've had with Socratic Med. Um, so we have two lectures per week. So these will be released on Sunday and Mondays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, so basically this lecture style, we will do um, about nine to 10 questions. Um, so I'll ask the question first, you'll take a few minutes to answer it. And then I will go through all of the topics that you would have needed to know to answer that question. All right, so our first question, we're gonna start at the very beginning uh, with fertilization. So the question reads, a man has a disease which causes him to produce sperm that lack acrosomes. His spermatozoa are abnormal because they blank. Um, so take a minute here and pause the video um, and try to answer this question. Alrighty, assuming that you have answered the question, I will reveal our answer, which is B, are unable to fertilize the egg. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the process of fertilization and how an acrosome um, plays into that and why that is necessary for fertilization. Um, so starting with ovulation, um, we're going to start with a secondary oocyte, which will enter the uterine tube following ovulation. Um, so the secondary oocyte is surrounded by the corona radiata and zona pellucida. Um, so the corona radiata is a protective layer of granulosa cells. Um, as you can see in this image on the right here, and then the zona pellucida is a protective jelly layer that surrounds the secondary oocyte. Um, so yeah, that's all pictured on the image on the right here. If you want a visual representation of any of that. Um, all right, so the next step, fertilization. So fertilization is what occurs when a spermatozoan fuses with the secondary oocyte um, while it is in the uterine tube. So this requires penetration of both the corona radiata and the zona pellucida, um, as discussed in the previous slide, those are the protective layers. So um, for the sperm to fuse with that egg, it'll need to penetrate both of those layers. So this is where our acrosome comes into play, the answer for our first question. Um, so that is what allows um, penetration of those two layers. So the sperm contain an acrosome, which is a hydrolytic enzyme containing vesicle that is present in the sperm head, um, and that allows it to penetrate the corona radiata. Um, the acromosal process um, is something that contains actin and bindin, which allows it to elongate and bind to the zona pellucida and allows fusion of the sperm and egg membranes. So you can see now why um, a male that lacked an acrosome would not be able to fertilize the egg because they would not be able to penetrate the corona radiata or the zona pellucida. So polyspermy, um, this is when an ovum is penetrated by more than one sperm. Um, and there are a couple blocks to this. So this isn't something that normally happens. Um, and the body tries to prevent this whenever possible. So the fast block to polyspermy um, is caused by the depolarization of the egg plasma membrane, which prevents other spermatozoa from fusing. 
Um, so when that's depolarized, they're not able to fuse with the egg cell membrane. And that's something that happens um, immediately once that first sperm successfully fuses. Um, and then the slow block is when the calcium influx from the initial depolarization causes swelling of the space between the plasma membrane and the zona pellucida, um, and then hardening of the zona pellucida. And this is also known as the cortical reaction. Um, so these two blocks are both in place to prevent polyspermy from occurring. Um, another important note here is that calcium influx from depolarization also increases metabolism and protein synthesis, um, which is known as egg activation. So now next step, cleavage. So the zygote um, that is now the fused egg and sperm will undergo many cell divisions and this starts about 36 hours after that initial fertilization. Um, so once this occurs, it forms a ball of cells, um, which can be called the marula. So when the cell, the marula will continuously divide and will eventually be known as the blastocyte, which is what we have pictured on the slide here. Um, so the process of the marula turning into the blastocyst um, is known as blastulation. So the blastocyst contains a ring of cells called the trophoblast, as you can see here, that's going around the outside, um, and then an inner cell mass, which you could see with these blue cells here. So the trophoblast will give rise to the chorion, and the inner cell mass will become the embryo. All right, question two. All right, each of the following contain the same genome except for which one of these four choices. So take a minute here, um, pause the video and answer the question. All right, assuming you've answered it, I'll just show the answer, which is C, endometrium. Um, and that is because A, B, and D are all um, stemming from the egg, whereas the endometrium is from the mother's genome. So that will not have the same genome as A, B, and D. Um, those are all going to come from that blastocyst. Um, so yeah, just to talk about what some of those structures are. So we just mentioned that the inner cell mass will um, eventually turn into the embryo. Um, it will also form the amnion, which is, um, it surrounds a fluid filled cavity that contains the embryo. So when you think of um, birth and the water breaking, that's amniotic fluid. So that is when that um, fluid filled cavity breaks and that fluid um, is then released. Um, it also forms the yolk sac which um, in mammals, this is the first site of red blood cell synthesis in the embryo. Um, mammals do not conserve their yolk like reptiles and birds, um, but for reptiles and birds, the yolk sac is important because it contains that nourishing yolk. And then the allantoy um, forms blood vessels of the umbilical cord, which is used to transport blood between the embryo and the placenta. So um, for the process of implantation, the blastocyst will implant in the endometrium. Um, so the trophoblast, which was the outer layer of cells, will secrete proteases, um, which will lyse endometrial cells. And this will allow that blastocyst to really sink down into the endometrium and be surrounded by it. Um, and then with the placenta, that takes about three months to develop. Um, and um, the placenta is a specialized organ that fa facilitates the exchange of nutrients and gases between the maternal and embryonic bloodstreams. Um, so a lot of what we just talked about will be talked about more in depth when we talk about the reproductive system, but just since we're talking about biological aging and development, um, I did want to go over a little bit of embryonic development and things like that. So... Think of this as a little introduction to some of these topics. All right, question three, embryonic development. All right, which of the following statements are false? 
Um, so one, oxygen must diffuse across the chorionic membrane to reach the fetus. Two, all cells of the blastocyst perform the same function. And three, transplanting cells from the trophoblast of one embryo to a different trophoblast will result in an infant with mixed genetic composition. Um, so this is one of our Roman numeral questions. So here, um, I would encourage you to find a Roman numeral that appears in exactly two answers and see if you're able to determine if that is definitely true or false. Um, and that will help you right away eliminate half of your answers. Um, so yeah, take a minute and pause the video here um, and go ahead and try to answer this question. All right, assuming you've answered the question now, I will show you guys the answer here, which is C, two and three. Um, so that means that our only true statement is that oxygen must diffuse across the chorionic membrane to reach the fetus. Um, yeah, so we'll just go into some of these subtopics a little bit more in depth now. All right, so gastrulation, um, this is where the three primary germ layers become distinct. So we have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Um, and here's a picture of a gastrula on the left that kind of shows these three different um, germ layers. And then this is kind of an abbreviated list as to what those will eventually turn into in the fetus. Um, we'll go in a little more depth on the next slide, but this kind of just shows you what these structures will turn into. So the ectoderm, you see the purple here um, is forming the nervous system. The mesoderm is performing the, or forming the muscular and skeletal system and the endoderm um, is forming some of the internal organs in that fetus. So the ectoderm will eventually form the nervous system, um, the pituitary glands and adrenal medulla, the cornea and lens, the epidermis of the skin, as well as the nasal, oral, and anal epithelium. The mesoderm will form muscle, bone, and connective tissue, um, cardiovascular and lymphatic system, urogenital organs, and the dermis of the skin. And the endoderm will form the GI tract epithelium and glands, respiratory epithelium, urinary bladder, and the epithelial lining of urogenital organs. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to just kind of memorize what all of these turn into. Um, it's pretty important for development. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. Um, you can kind of generally think ecto outside. So it's like the skin and things like that, but also the nervous system, mesoderm, you think muscle, um, endoderm, you think inside. So um, it's pretty general and not super helpful, but just a very generic way to help you start memorizing um, what these germ layers will turn into um, as that fetus develops. So neurulation is the formation of the nervous system. Um, so as we just said, the ectoderm is what will form the nervous system. So the ectoderm will differentiate into the neural plate, which you can see here on the right. Um, and then the neural crest cells, which are at the neural plate border, um, will thicken and fold upwards, forming these neural folds. And then this neural groove will eventually become the neural tube. Um, and that will be our central nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord. Um, and yeah, the neural crest cells will break off and separate the epidermis from that neural tube. All right, question four, we're going to talk about infancy. A loud boom of thunder startles an infant, causing them to extend their limbs and cry. What reflex is responsible for these movements? All right, so take a minute here and pause the video and answer your question. All right, assuming that you have had a chance to answer the question, I'll show you guys the answer, which is B, the Moro reflex. Um, so now we're just gonna go through what all these infantile reflexes are, um, just so you guys can be 
uh, more familiar with them. All right, so the moro reflex is when a baby will be startled at loud sounds and it will extend its limbs out, cry, and pull its limbs back in. The rooting reflex um, is when a baby will turn their head when they're touched on the cheek um, and they will open their mouth to breastfeed. The Babinski reflex is when the sole of the foot is stroked, the baby will fan out its toes and curl its big toe upwards. Um, the Palmer grasp reflex is when the baby will grasp in response to a stroke of the hand. The tonic neck reflex, um, this is when the baby's head is turned one way. Um, that arm on that side of the head will extend outward while the other arm will bend upwards at the elbow. Um, if you look this one up, it's kind of funny to realize that this is just how a lot of pictures of babies laying down. You don't realize that this is a reflex when they're in that position. Um, the walking or stepping reflex is when a baby's foot touches a flat surface, they will attempt to put the other foot in front. Um, this reflex is kind of interesting because it disappears around six weeks of age and it will reappear around 10 months. Um, so that's why babies aren't walking when they're you know, six weeks old. But if you hold an infant up at the ground and put their feet on it, they will try to put one foot in front of the other, essentially. Um, the sucking reflex is when a baby will suck when something touches the roof of its mouth, such as a, a bottle. Um, so infantile motor development. So um, the first year of an infant's life is mostly dominated by these reflexes that we just talked about. So um, these are known as reflexive movements. So that's basically all the movements that are occurring in the first year of life. Um, the first voluntary movements of a baby's life are known as rudimentary movements. And these include um, things such as rolling, crawling, or sitting up. Uh, fundamental movements develop from ages two to seven when children begin to engage in play and become more physically independent these movements uh, require a little bit more coordination than the rudimentary movements. Um, and they are things such as running, throwing, and jumping. Specialized movements occur from ages seven to 14 and are similar to fundamental movements, but added skill and strategies. You can think of like playing a sport. So playing basketball, you know, there's it's more than just running or throwing. It's a mix of both with, with some skill and strategy that you need as well. Um, and application of movement is from adolescence on, where we will continue to apply and refine movements on a daily basis. All right, question number five is about infancy as well. So an individual will have the most neurons in their life at which point? So take a minute here and pause the video and answer this question. All right, assuming you've answered the question, I will reveal the answer. The answer here is going to be A, birth. Um, so at birth, this is when an individual will have the most neurons in their lifetime. Um, yeah, so um, even though they will have the most neurons in their life at this point, they will not have many neural networks. So those are the routes for information processing, um, so this is why when babies are born, they can't just talk and everything because they haven't formed those neural networks yet. So they're not able to process all the information. Um, so these neural networks will develop as children grow and learn. Um, infantile amnesia is, um, this refers to the ability or the inability of humans to remember any events before the age of around three or three and a half years old. Um, so that's why you don't really have any memories as a baby. Um, but this does not mean that you can't learn or remember um, when you are an infant. Um, you just can't remember that later in your life. So infants obviously are still, you know, learning a little bit um, at this age, but you are just unable to recall that now. Um, so that's why your first conscious memories will be around three and a half or four years old. 
Uh, maturation is the sequence by which children grow and develop. Um, and this is mostly genetic, but there is some influence from the environment. So not having access to learning materials at a young age can delay cognitive processing. Um, that's just an example as to how the environment can impact uh, maturation. All right, question six, so we're gonna talk about cognitive development. Um, so according to Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, which of the following would be the most important for a college senior to accomplish? Um, so take a minute here and you can pause the video and answer the question. All right, assuming you've answered it, I will show you the answer for this one. Um, the answer here is going to be A, forming an intimate relationship. Um, so a college senior would be, I would assume about 21, 22 years old. Um, so using that information, you would then have to figure out which um, stage of Erickson's psychosocial development this individual is in to be able to determine which of these four would be the most important. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna go through the eight stages, um, talk a little bit about Erickson and uh, the important accomplishments of all of those stages. Um, so Erickson, um, we'll talk about Freud's psychosexual stages next, um, but Erickson basically focused less on sexual energy and more on how we perceive our identity at various stages of life. So that's why these are psychosocial stages versus Freud's uh, psychosexual stages. So according to Erickson, an individual will emerge from each stage, either strength strengthening their character or with a sense of inadequacy regarding um, that specific part of their personality. So the eight stages are trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, identity versus role confusion, intimacy versus isolation, generativity versus stagnation, and integrity versus despair. Um, so Erickson is also different from Freud in that he has eight stages, whereas Freud only has five. Um, again, we'll talk about Freud at the next question, um, but just want to familiarize you guys with that, um, some key differences between the two of them. All right, so stage one, this is trust versus mistrust. Um, Erickson believed this occurred from birth to 18 months of age. And this is when newborns are completely dependent on their parents. Um, so parents that are caring and attentive to their infants will allow them to develop a sense of trust. Um, and parents that are uncaring, unsupportive, or unattentive will um, prevent those children from developing a sense of trust and they will likely fail to develop trust all the way through their adulthood. Um, stage two here is autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is from 18 months to about three years of age. Um, this is where children begin to develop motor skills and therefore developing some physical independence. So they're not completely dependent on the parents anymore. So when parents are supportive in this stage, children are able to develop a sense of adequacy and control. Um, if they are not allowed to be independent or are shamed for their mistakes, then they will develop feelings of shame and doubt. Um, stage three, this is from around ages three to five years of age. So this is when children are navigating new social environments for the first time as they enter preschool. Um, when they are able to navigate these on their own, they will develop initiative. And when they are punished for how they are navigating their new environment, they will develop a sense of guilt, um, which will inhibit their ability to initiate. Um, so you can kind of see the theme so far, um, whatever the name of the stage is, basically that first word is what you're trying to achieve. And if that is not achieved, then you'll develop whatever the second word is. Um, so stage four, this is from ages five to 12. This is where 
children will attempt to demonstrate the initiative that they hopefully developed um, in the previous stage from ages three to five um, in their new social groups. So when they're in elementary school at this age, um, they want to show their initiative and use that to participate um, in these social groups. So they're able to do that successfully without being ridiculed either by their peers or um, you know teachers or parents then they will develop a sense of competence, which can also be called industry. Um, and then if, they're, <clears throat> if their attempts are punished, they will feel a sense of inferiority um, to their peers. All right, so stage five here is identity versus role confusion. This is from ages 12 to 18 years. Um, this is where children will begin exploring new activities and um, establishing themselves in social groups, and they will try to solidify their identity. So if they're able to do this, they will gain a sense of ego and be able to successfully develop their own system of ideals and beliefs. Um, if they are not able to do this, then they will develop role confusion. Um, yeah, so stage six is intimacy versus isolation. So this is the stage that our hypothetical college senior would have been in from our, our question about Erickson. Um, so this is from ages 18 to 40 years. So this is where young adults begin to seek intimacy and relationships. Um, so the ability to form meaningful relationships at this point confirms um, that an individual was able to successfully develop over the previous five stages. So they've developed trust and everything that they need to successfully form a meaningful, intimate relationship. Um, and then that being said, failure in some, all or any of those previous stages can inhibit an individual from establishing secure relationships, um, which will cause that person to feel isolated or alone and sometimes even lead to depression. Stage seven is generativity versus stagnation. This is um, for middle-aged adults from ages 40 to 65. Um, this is where adults will experience a desire to give back to their communities um, and partake in productive activities. So feeling like they're giving something back. Um, so those who are able to complete these activities or participate in things that give back to their community will feel a sense of generativity. Um, and those who fail will feel uninvolved or stagnant. Um, stage eight, this is our final stage of Erickson's uh, psychosocial development. That's from age 65 to death. Um, this is where if an individual can look back on their life and feel pride, accomplishment, basically not have any regrets, um, they will establish a sense of integrity. Whereas if they look back on their life filled with regret, then they will experience despair, fear, and anxiety. Um, so that was Erickson's stage of development, uh, definitely a pretty high yield topic for psych -soch. Um So I would encourage you to have all of those memorized um, with the corresponding ages, um, and then you can kind of um, figure out what is developed in each stage based on the name, if you have those memorized. All right, so question seven, more cognitive development. Um, a child who is working on developing motor skills and becoming physically independent is likely in which of Freud's psychosexual stages of development? All right, take a minute here and pause the video um, and answer the question. Alrighty, assuming that you've answered this question, I will reveal the answer here, which is going to be B, the anal stage. Um, so yeah, these are four out of the five stages of Freud's psychosexual development. So we will go through all five, um, what ages they are. And at the end, I will recap those um, Freud and Erickson stages next to each other um, so you can work on memorizing which stage um, from each goes with the other. 
Um, so for Freudian psychosexual development, um, basically Sigmund Freud, I've pictured here on the slide, he believed that um, the way in which an individual channels sexual energy throughout childhood is a major factor in their personality formations. So that's why he broke up um, development into these psychosexual stages. Um, he focused mostly on the first five years of life because he believed this was when humans developed the ego and the superego, which were very important um, components to personality. So that is why he only has the five stages and doesn't really um, break them up in later life as Erickson did. So stage one, this is from birth to one year. This is known as the oral stage. This is where infants focus on sucking, biting, and breastfeeding. Um, so failure to satisfy these urges um, will result in an oral fixation throughout adulthood, which can be seen in um, personality traits such as uh, smoking cigarettes or biting pens or something like that. Stage two is the anal stage. This is from ages one to three years where children are working on potty training and they are concerned with their ability to control defecation. Um, so failure to satisfy this stage, such as not being potty trained at this age would make an individual anal retentive in adulthood. Stage three is the phallic stage. This is from ages three to six. Um, this is where a child focuses on their genitals and usually identifies with the same sex parent. Um, stage four is the latent stage. This is from ages six to puberty. Um, so you can think around 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there. Um, this is a period that Freud believed to be of sexual dormancy, um, and the child is too preoccupied with learning, making social connections, and acquiring new skills to um, have any sort of fixation in this age. Um, stage five is the genital stage. This is from puberty to adulthood. This is where young adults will begin to experiment sexually and eventually settle down with a partner. Um, and this is where you will see fixations that are rooted in other stages. So failure to satisfy those previous urges in other stages will um, lead to um, issues in their life from puberty to adulthood. Um, so here I have a chart showing which uh, Freud stage correlate which with with which of Erickson stages. Um, so a question that I've seen in a lot of MCAT practice and uh, maybe on the MCAT exam are not so much just saying, oh, one to three years, what is that for Freud's stage? It'll be like, oh, they're in the phallic stage. What is that for Erickson? So you really need to know both of these stages um, in and out. So yeah, if you have the ages memorized, for both, then it shouldn't be a problem just uh, recalling one and then the other based on the age. Um, yeah, so the only one that's really easy to memorize here is um, the anal stage versus autonomy, um, because for both, they're the only ones that start with A. Other than that, it's pretty much just, you just need to commit it to memory and it, it is what it is. All right, question eight, we're going to talk a little bit more about cognitive development. At what stage do children first grasp the concept of conservation? All right, so that answer is C, the concrete operational stage. Um, so we're going to go through um, these stages now really quickly um, as we're sort of getting to the end of development. Um, so Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development um, basically considered inputs um, both biologic and environmental. Um, so Piaget's four stages include the sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, 
and the formal operational stage. So we're going to go through these four um, and see what comes, uh, what ages they all occur at and what important developmental milestones we're reaching with each of those. So the sensory motor stage, this is from birth to two years of age. Um, this is where infants first learn about their world using their senses. Um, so the following cognitive abilities develop during this stage. Um, one is self-recognition, which is where an infant is able to understand oneself in terms of their traits, behaviors, and feelings. Um, another that I see come up a lot on the MCAT um, in prep um, either as a standalone or a lot of times within a passage. Um, a lot of these stages, honestly, are pretty big topics for psych -soch. So I would definitely definitely be familiar with um, the cognitive abilities that develop in each of these stages and the ages and the name of the stage. Um, so yeah, object permanence. This is when an infant is able to understand that things still exist even when you can't see them. So um, this is something they develop from birth to two years. So basically, if you're taking a toy and hiding it behind something, um, eventually they won't think that it disappeared. They'll know that it's still there. It's just out of sight. Um, deferred imitation. This is when an infant repeats an action after a period of time has passed. So it's not just, just copying motions um, as they're occurring, but basically being able to remember um, an action and repeat it later. Um, in this stage, infants also will experience stranger anxiety, which is when they become distressed when they are presented with a stranger. Um, so the second stage of Piaget um, laid out is the pre-operational stage. This is from ages two to seven. This is where children develop the ability to think about the world symbolically um, rather than just using their senses and motor functions as they were in the sensory motor stage. Um, so here they're starting to have the ability to use language and mental imagery to represent the world around them, um, but they are still lacking that ability to think logically or critically. Um, so some relevant terms in the pre-operational stage are animism, which is the personification of inanimate objects. So it's something that a lot of young children will do. Um, and um, egocentrism, this is the inability to recognize that others see the world from a different perspective. So um, children in this age are can be known as egocentric. Um, this is something that will resolve um, in the following stage. So the concrete operational stage, the third stage laid out by Piaget, this is from ages seven to 11 years old. Um, this is where children develop the ability to think logically about concrete events. Um, so they still are not able to think logically about abstract concepts. Um, here's where they start becoming less egocentric. And one important, one important cognitive ability that's developed in this stage is um, conservation. So that's basically the understanding that something can remain the same despite a change in appearance. Um, that's what this picture here on the bottom of the slide is. So if you were to show someone age five, these two um, uh, water containers, they would think that one is bigger than the other because they lack um, the ability to understand conservation. But then if you showed a similar thing to someone age eight or nine, um, then they would be more likely to understand that there are the same amount uh, despite the difference appearance. Um, so our final stage here is the formal operational stage. Um, that is from ages 12 onwards. So this is where children learn to reason abstractly about concepts and objects that are not physically there. Um, and they gain the ability to think critically, hypothesize and understand reasoning more completely. Um, and they are finally able to construct and follow an argument without thinking in terms of examples. Um, yeah, so those are the four stages for Piaget. Um, definitely know the ages again, the name of the stage and any important cognitive abilities that are developed in those stages.
All right, question nine. This is more of a uh, bio topic, but we're going to talk briefly about cellular aging. So our question here is, in eukaryotic cells, the length of which cellular component correlates with the age of the cell? Um, so take a minute here and pause the video and answer the question. All right, assuming you've answered the question, I will reveal our answer, which is going to be B, the telomere. Um, this one is pretty just a straight up memory question. Um, the telomere is the only thing that correlates with the age of a cell. So a longer telomere will indicate a younger cell um, and they will shorten with age. Um, so senescence is a word that can be used to describe the process of biological aging at the cellular and organismal level. Um, so in eukaryotic cells, the length of telomeres on the end of the chromosomes will correspond with age. Um, as I just said, the longer the telomere, the younger the cell. Um, telomeres are normally maintained by the enzyme telomerase. Um, and there's some research going into if you can maintain the length of a telomere, can you prevent cellular aging? Um, it's still going on. I mean, you obviously can't prevent aging entirely, but um, just something fun to note. Um, yeah, so as cells age, they become more prone to apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And as these cells begin to die off and um, this will lead to the slowing of organ systems and their functioning, which will cause an organism to age and eventually die. Um, so yeah, we will definitely talk more about age-related changes um, for specific organ systems for the lectures about those organ systems. Um, but just in general, like when when people say someone died of old age, um, that's not really a thing. Basically, um, there some organ system is not functioning properly, and that's what le led to death eventually. So. Um, that's just due to this senescence um, and apoptosis of these cells. Um, when they start dying off, the organ systems will start failing. So basically, it's whichever organ system fails first, that would ultimately be the cause of death. Um, yeah. So that is today's lecture on cellular or on biological and cognitive aging and development. Um, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to message me or just send them out in the group me in general. Um, we'll be happy to help you out with that. Um, so coming up on Sunday next week, we have a bio biochem lecture about the renal and digestive systems, um, which will be released at 8.30 p.m. on YouTube. And then Monday, we will have another bio biochem lecture on the cardiac and pulmonary systems also release at 8.30 p.m. on YouTube. Um, yeah, thanks so much for watching today's lecture. Again, feel free to message me if you have any questions. And um, as always, happy studying.